You're listening to Catholic Chicago. Ahead, the Archdiocese of Chicago brings you programs about the people, events, and issues that touch our lives. Welcome to Catholic Chicago. Chicago and beyond, and welcome to the March edition of Fully Alive, the radio program and podcast of the Office of Human Dignity and Solidarity at the Archdiocese of Chicago. I'm your host, Dawn Fitzpatrick, and joining me this morning, I have a couple of co-workers who work with uh, the Catholic Relief Services in our Office of Human Dignity and Solidarity. First, we have our senior coordinator for um, CRS and CCHD, Danny Baudet. And then joining us also is a, our CRS intern, Joao Nito, who is a student at the Catholic Theological Union. And he is also a member of the Divine World Missionary Order. So welcome to you both. Thank you, it's so Thank good you. to be here. Yes, yes, it's great to have you. And of course, we're going to talk about Catholic Relief Services. Uh, people are pretty familiar with um, Lent and how it and how it relates to the CRS, but we'll talk some more about that. But first, why don't you just tell us, give us some enlightenment. What um, what is our relationship with CRS at the Office of Human Dignity and Solidarity, or in the Archdiocese? Yeah, we're so lucky to partner so closely with Catholic Relief Services. Mm -hmm. um, as a senior coordinator, I kind of act as the liaison between um, the Archdiocese and the larger Catholic Relief Services. Mm -hmm. Obviously, CRS is a massive organization, and their size allows them to do amazing work all across the globe. Um, and I think sometimes it's just helpful to have people be a liaison between such a big organization doing so much work, mm -hmm. and then with such a complimentary partner being the Archdiocese of Chicago and just kind of, you know, I feel like my job is really just to, to brag about CRS and, right. and just brag to the people in the pews about the good work that they're doing and just invite them to be involved. Mm -hmm. So I know we've had um, people from CRS on this show before. They certainly do a lot of work with us. Um, and there are people who work here in Chicago, but they actually represent like a larger area, like a region. Um, and then also do work, like you said, around the globe. So what are some of the things we as the Archdiocese does along with, alongside of CRS or to support CRS? Yeah, absolutely. I would say first and foremost, it's to promote the work that they're already doing and mm -hmm. to advertise and publicize that work and, and really just try to work with CRS chapters and clubs to keep people engaged and involved. Um, you know, it happens all the time that something happens across the globe and and sure, you, you might feel connected to it for the first day or three that it has occurred. But then after that, those things start to dwindle. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like CRS does a great job of keeping people engaged. And um, I really see kind of my first job as as being of assistance to them in, in the diocesan context. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly is that I help facilitate the CRS Rice Bowl program, which mm -hmm. is starting now here at the sure. beginning of Lent. So that's that's kind of the second main thing that I do. Okay. So I know um, a lot of times around the course of, a, of the year, there might be a disaster somewhere, like an earthquake or a tsunami or um, something that destroys a whole section of a country, even in, in a third world country or somewhere. Um, and often as Catholics, we'll you know, band together because we want to help those people. And that's what CRS does that I've seen a lot of, at least in, in the parishes, is they'll lead a campaign to take care of those people. I mean, we're, we're called to to um, clothe, clothe the naked, to feed the hungry. And that's what they're really doing is, is all of those social ministry things and outreach to, um, to people who are needy or find themselves all of a sudden homeless or without um, water, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we'll have collections. I know that all of those checks then come into our office and we kind of act as a clearinghouse. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, sometimes it's easiest for people to send us the checks and we then forward those straight to Catholic Relief Services. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, uh, people people know some of what Catholic Relief Services does, and think thankfully their information is so easily accessible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I've learned more about Catholic Relief Services through this role, I've learned that they really are some of the first responders in these situations. You know, take the earthquake in um, Syria and Turkey, or take the war in Ukraine. They really have been kind of at the front line of those um, of those situations, and we really just want to help people, you know, continue to raise awareness for these situations and then offer a plethora of ways for them to, to stay engaged. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of what we do in terms of, of like current, current events. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about Lent because I know that's a lot of what people see every year that something that Catholic Relief Services does regularly and that is, especially in the schools and in the faith formation programs, they distribute these rice bowls. I know you have one here. Mm -hmm. um, so if you if you happen to be watching us on our podcast, that's what it looks like. And it just kind of, it's designed to, to turn into a, like a bowl. Mm -hmm. um, uh, talk a little, let's talk a little bit about what that's all about. And if your children happen to bring one of those home, I mean, you, hopefully you're all used to it, but what, what is the purpose of it? What, and what, what are we doing with those? Yeah, absolutely. I when I first saw these boxes and and realized that was going to be a lot of what I was doing in this job, I just started laughing because I remember being like eight and uh -huh. using it as a maraca in class when I <laughs> after I like filled it with my coins. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and it it's just so funny that 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 these you know you say rice bowl to someone and if they don't know what you mean when you say rice bowl like you show them this and and then everyone's like oh yeah i put all my coins in that so it's very it feels very full circle to then be distributing these to schools um and uh, to really just you know keep people in engage with lent and um joao my intern and i have been doing a lot of work with trying to think of you know how can we best promote this material to 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 keep it aligned with Lent and aligned with um, just kind of that, that thought of prayer, um, fasting, and almsgiving. Uh, so Joao, do you want to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing to, to promote Rice Bowl and how it ties in with Lent? Yes. Uh, first, this is my first experience since I came from a, a different context of the church because uh, I grew up not knowing what uh, Rice Bowl was. And moving to the, to the United States and in this context of, of church is such a new uh, experience. But what I really uh, appreciate from uh, uh, what we are doing in Lenten season uh, with the rice ball, it is sense of uh, engaging uh, families um, and accompanying uh, Jesus in this journey. Also, the way of, of sharing what, what they have. Uh, I think uh, in our office, we have trying uh, our best uh, to uh, publish um, uh, this uh, work on, on social media and our, our website so that the families can be more uh, familiar with uh, the rice ball. The way of sharing with the other, especially those uh, uh, who need more help in this season. And as you said, uh, the, the homeless and those who don't have enough uh, that's a way of the families living this uh, special time of Lent. Mm -hmm. So I know we encourage people to put coins in them, and I've I've been also working at a parish when we actually take all those coins and try to roll them so we can <laughs> send them. But sometimes they just come into you in the box, probably, uh -huh. right? And then you have to take care of that, <laughs> right? Because you can't really mail um, all those coins off to CRS. Yeah, unfortunately, no. <laughs> Um, there are certainly other ways to note to donate. Um, you can go on our um, CRS webpage on the Archdiocese website, um, and you can from there you can access the Give Central link. Um, so if coins aren't your jam, I totally understand. <laughs> Gave up my piggy bank a while ago, right? Um, so you're more than welcome to donate online. Well, it used to be. I know when I was a kid, um, we didn't use credit cards very often. So, mm -hmm. it, or we certainly didn't have debit cards. Though those are a relatively new creation, believe it or not. <laughs> you probably you probably think they've been around forever, but they haven't. So I know that collecting coins. I mean, sometimes we would have a big jug in our house, and you would just fill it up with coins, and then yeah. see what you had at the end of the year, or what have you which is kind of where I think this came from. It's kind of like a piggy bank mm -hmm. that you use during Lent. Um, 
So, so what are some ways, though, you know, I mean, children could certainly have coins they could mm -hmm. bring to it, or a family could collect money and mm -hmm. give a check. I mean, that's it. Or donate t through our Give Central at the office. But um, there's more of a, a spirit of, um, you know, almsgiving and fasting that need to go along with it because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a Lenten project. So why don't we talk a little bit about that project? Yeah. It's a part of it I didn't understand until I got involved work for the church. When I was a youth minister, mm -hmm. I tried to make this a project for my youth group, and it was a lot more than just collect your coins. Yeah, so, so what are some ways we can use this as a Lenten project? Yeah, yeah. Um, on the inside of these fun boxes, there is a um, Lenten calendar that have different, you know, prayer and challenges and reflections and things of that sort. So I'd say that's kind of where the prayer uh, component comes on. Mm -hmm. um, I think for kids, it's really accessible to have kind of a daily goal um, and for adults as well. <laughs> I, I'm not exempt from that. Um, and in addition, if you go on the CRS website um, under Rice Bowl, you can find Lenten um, recipes and mm -hmm. they're all very simplistic. And I think that's part of fasting as well. It, it doesn't mean you know necessarily not eating. It means maybe eating simpler things um, and letting that kind of become part of your your Lenten ritual. So those are two two mm -hmm. ways to incorporate the other parts. Well, and I think, um, I, I remember going to a conference one time and there was an option to have a third world lunch is what they called it. And they said, well, it's Lent, so why don't you come in? It'll be like, it was like rice and soup. <laughs> um, and then we would take the money we would have spent on, on having a big lunch and putting it in the rice bowl. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the idea. So rather than just putting money in the bowl, Think about what you're going to give up mm -hmm. and or and then in the spirit of, well, I want to be in solidarity with the hungry. Mm -hmm. I'm going to eat more simply. I'm going to do something that leaves me wanting a little bit, but I'm going to offer that up as a Lenten fast mm -hmm. and then take the money I would have spent and we'll be able to give it to the people that really need it. Yeah, especially when it comes to something like eating out. I feel like it's mm -hmm. it's so easy because, I mean, most of the time that doesn't really nourish our bodies all that well anyway. So it's not like you're giving up some kind of like nourishment that just as humans we need, but it's it's giving up that something extra and putting putting that then towards something else. So I think that's a great idea. Right. Okay, so it's time for us to take our first break. Um, when we come back, we'll, we'll talk some more about this and what how we can use these rice bowls during Lent. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Caring adults make all the difference in the lives of adolescents. Catholic Charities understands this, and our mentorship programs provide a free opportunity for young adults to spend time with volunteers who genuinely care about them. This program is ideal for youth aged 9 through 12 who may need support navigating the challenges of childhood and early adolescence. Our amazing volunteers service friends who help youth recognize their strengths and empower them to reach their full potential. 
Catholic Charities conducts a thorough background check on every volunteer, and our program coordinator closely monitors and supports every relationship. Mentoring is a fun after-school program that can help young adults build confidence and enjoy fun activities with their peers, too. To learn more, visit catholiccharities.net or call 312-655-7970 in Cook County and 847-782-4224 in Lake County. We're connecting youth with great role models. Join us today. Folks, you probably know that on March 13th, we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the election of Pope Francis as the Bishop of Rome. Ever since his election, he has asked the people of God to pray for him. And so we are joining in an effort asking Catholics on March 13th to say 10 Hail Marys for him. You can learn more about this and register your name at archchicago.org. I encourage all of you to participate in this support of the Holy Father as he celebrates a decade of service to the people of God. Welcome back to Fully Alive, the radio program of the Office of Human Dignity at the Archdiocese of Chicago. I'm Dawn Fitzpatrick, your host. And today I am talking to some coworkers about our relationship with Catholic Relief Services. And we were specifically talking about the rice bowl and how you might be able to make this a part of your Lenten practice. Um, now that we're in Lent, we've, only, we've been in Lent for about a week now. Wednesday, last week was Ash Wednesday. So, you know, it's not too late to take on a project. Um, you can get these at most of your Catholic schools or your faith formation programs, or you can reach out to Danny um, in our office and she'll send you one either way. But uh, we were just talking about different ways people could use these. I talked about a third world lunch option that um, I experienced on a conference one time. I also know when I was a youth minister, I had said to my teenagers, how about give up your Starbucks every day and take that three to five dollars, who knows how much it costs now, right? And uh, that you would have spent and put it in the rice bowl. And then it's kind of like you gave up the coffee for Lent, but instead of just pocketing that extra cash, you're going to give that to the hungry. So it becomes a, then a fast and a project all in one. Um, and I'm sure the schools do similar things with the kids. Have you thought of, heard of other things that they might do or ways that they encourage the kids to take advantage of this or the families? Well, all I know is that Starbucks trick is not just for teenagers. I, <laughs> I, could, I could certainly uh, use that myself. I'll keep that in my head for next year. Um, I think just something for people of really all ages, and I think that this, you know, would take a, a different – um, turn depending on the age, but you know, as you sit with your rice bowl and you think about um, CRS and all that it does, I really mm -hmm. encourage people to, like, you know, donating is is great, and putting all the coins in the box or donating on, donating online is great, and I think there is such a need for contemplative prayer mm -hmm. in this and with this. Um, so I guess I just really encourage people to to pray with the idea of solidarity and pray with the ideas of subsidiarity and yes. what does that what does that mean you know what how do you how do you see that like on the most nuclear level in your own life and then kind of like if they're concentric circles slowly bring them out because you can't really think about or I should speak for myself I can't really think about solidarity with someone across the globe until I've thought about solidarity like in my most immediate circle because I think that's just more tangible and understandable um so like starting there and praying with that like what does that look like and then kind of slowly like bring the concentric circles out um because I think um I think it's so important to think what does solidarity what is it, just what does it mean and what mm -hmm. does it look like and I think um it always comes down to the prepositions that we use it's it's standing with and walking with yes. it's not it's not doing for 
or or things of that sort. Um, and I think Catholic Relief Services has a lot of good material out there talking about these ideas aligning with Catholic social teaching. Um, so, yeah, I just encourage a lot of prayer. So um, I know that there's a CRS website and probably if somebody were to navigate to, is it crs.org? Mm -hmm. And then they could start to dig into what are the programs going on, what it, what's, you know, there's also a lot just to pray about mm -hmm. and a lot of situations. You can read different, um, like, like different scenarios of what different people are going through and how CRS might be helping them. So if um, somebody were to pray with something like that and mm -hmm. then put them, try to put themselves with that person mm -hmm. or what would it be like to be in that person's shoes? I mean, it's kind of like sometimes what we call a visio divina where mm -hmm. you start to put yourself into the situation and mm -hmm. imagine you're there. Um, and then if you're also um, taking some steps to sacrifice something, mm -hmm. then you'll be able to say, okay, so this little bit of discomfort helps me to feel closer to that person. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, to aid in, in those thoughts and prayers, there's actually um, a page on the CRS website that has Lenten reflections mm -hmm. um, and, and stories of the people that have been involved with CRS projects. And I think reading those and familiarizing yourself with those can be a good way um, to, to, yeah, put yourself in relationship with that person. Yeah. You perhaps have not met them and right. you almost certainly haven't met them, but um, kind of reading their story and and relating to it, I think, is definitely putting that with preposition mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. in place. Right. Pope Francis has been very um, very supportive of accompaniment. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of his big things: is how can we accompany others to, just so that everybody knows that they do have partners in this life mm -hmm. and that we are all here together. And of course, as we've said, solidarity is one of our themes of social teaching. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of people don't know what solidarity means, mm -hmm. but it's just for us to understand and to really put ourselves in the shoes of our brothers and sisters and realize we're all children of God. Mm -hmm. And we've all been put in different life situations, mm -hmm. but we need to be able to join ourselves to our brothers and sisters all over the world. Um, and sometimes that's hard to do because we don't see them, right? Uh, necessarily, especially if they're in a third world country and there's not a lot of media and things like that. We may not, it's almost like they're easy to forget you know, it's easy to forget there's somebody over there that might need our help. Or... Yeah, I think it's e I think it's also just as easy to forget that there's someone across the street. Right. Um, you know, it's it's like it's all about what we expose ourselves to and who mm -hmm. we expose ourselves to and who we position ourselves in places to meet um, these people. And and that's why I'm so happy that 75 percent of what we raise in Rice Bowl goes to overseas projects and then 25 percent stays local. And that is really where the mm -hmm. um, the positioning ourselves to get engaged with our own community comes in. Um, and that's yeah. a, a really good point because I don't think everybody realizes that although a lot of the money goes overseas or to other countries, there's still money that stays local. Mm -hmm. So what does CRS do in the local community? Yeah, so we administer a grant program called mm -hmm. CRS Rice Bowl Grants. Um, and those are mini grants that are really meant to help direct service organizations in, in their efforts to feed, clothe, um, accompany uh, people. And Joao and I have actually gotten the chance to speak with a few of our grantees from um, previous years. And Joao, I was wondering if you had any insights from our conversations with those that have stuck out to you. Uh, as we work with our um, grantees, uh, the nonprofit organizations, uh, what I always try to, to say as, as church, as a body of Christ, we are all called to minister each other. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's what uh, people are doing in locally in Chicago. Um, people have been really doing a lot of work by collaborating with us, uh, by uh, especially those who work with food pantries and, and soup kitchen. They really make a lot of difference in the, in the community. And that's a way of, 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 of serving each other because uh, ministry, it is, it is service. And most of the time, uh, these organizations, especially those who are not f uh, affiliated to uh, uh, religious institutions, they think they're just doing like a social work. And I think it's not just a social work. It is also a ministry. That's mm -hmm. the part I always emphasize uh, whenever we are, we are uh, working with them. Mm -hmm. So um, 
So what does it take to get a grant from Rice Bowl? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, our grant cycle begins um, kind of in August, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's, it's a pretty simple application. Um, just kind of tell us what you do and, and those t sorts of things, and those can be found um, on our website this summer. And then we have a team of people that reviews them, and then we notify people of, of award notices. So it's a simple process. I find the application to be pretty accessible. It's, it's nothing overly complicated, which I think we have enough overly complicated of course. Um, <laughs> grant applications out there, as anyone in the nonprofit sector knows. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity, um, and it's been such a joy to just get involved with these other nonprofits in the area. It's really building power. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I see it. Um, anytime you build relationship, you build power. So what kind of nonprofit would normally ask for a grant or be given a grant? Yeah, that's a great question. So anything direct service, so meaning, um, yeah, food pantries, soup kitchens, um, giving out uh, clothing, providing shelter, um, anything, anything where you're you're providing for an immediate need. Mm -hmm. Well, and I know a lot of parishes have food pantries exactly. or, or clothing um, boutiques or yeah. different things like that. So those groups could apply. Parishes are strongly, strongly encouraged to apply whatever, um, you know, whatever ministry, especially if I think uh, the Rice Bowl grant is an excellent opportunity for a parish to, to kind of start up something if they're looking for some like seed money to just kickstart uh -huh. uh, food pantry whatever um so if any parish is looking at the community and assessing a need and they think that with yeah. um you know uh 1500 to five thousand dollars they can assess that they That's can great. start to assess that need then by all means i strongly encourage um that parish to reach out to me well and on this program we've we've been talking a lot about the um, walking with moms in need initiative and one of the things that that initiative uh, suggests is that the parish find a project that is in a place where there's a void um, and it might be feeding the the hungry families it might be um, providing um, you know lunches or rides to moms or whatever and so that could be the kind of project that could apply for mm -hmm. a crs grant yeah right absolutely because it's taking care of humanity really which Absolutely. is what this is all about. And I, would, I think it's also really important to note that um, there's there's a bit of a vetting process. I mean, you always make sure that they're a worthy cause and they follow Catholic teaching and things like that. Absolutely. Um, all of the all of the grantees agree to adhering to Catholic social teaching. They by no means have to be Catholic, strictly yeah. Yeah, Catholic or religious organizations. Um, and, and that's part of solidarity as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we see that there are issues um, regardless of our faith perspective that we all stand on. Um, but we, we do certainly vet these organizations and um, we stay really focused on on the good work. And m most importantly, we stay focused on the gospel. Sure. Um, yes, very, very focused on um, uh, feeding, feeding hungry yeah. and providing clothes. Well, this is, this is exactly what Jesus told us to do, right? You know, take care of each other. Um, and every time you serve the least of my brothers, you're taking care of me. That's what Jesus said. So we are, um, we are taking care of Jesus, really. <laughs> and that's what we're called to do as, as Catholic Christians. Um, I think this is a great way for us to be involved in that. And, and that's, I mean, that's our job, really. Mm -hmm. it's, um, we'd much rather you know, ask our, our fellow uh, Christians to help people than anything else. So that's what we do. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a gift to, to have a call to respond to, and, and all of us have that call and mm -hmm. are called to it every day. So it's a sure. joy to be a part of it. It's what I used to work for um, with with this DRE when I was in a parish, and she would say, "You're baptized. What are you doing about it?" You know, <laughs> that's that that call that you're we're all given. So, Absolutely. all right. Well, I'd like to thank you you two for joining me today. It's been a nice conversation. I hope that we've intrigued some people to <laughs> get involved with Rice Bowl and take on a project with their family. And if anybody has any questions, how can they reach you quickly, Danny? Yeah, by email at uh, dbodet at artschicago.org. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have or tell you more about it. Okay. And we also on the Office of Human Dignity and Solidarity webpage, yes. there's more information. Absolutely. So, all right. Well, thank you two for joining us. And uh, audience, stick with me. I have another guest coming up after the break. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you.
Catholic Charities Family Self-Sufficiency Program has assisted thousands of single parents who are working to become more self-sufficient through education and employment opportunities. Our experienced case managers accompany participants for up to five years on their journey to identify, address, and break down barriers to improving their quality of life Folks, you probably and achieving know that meaningful Mark goals for themselves and for their families. Professional, compassionate assistance is offered in a safe and trusting environment as participants develop the skills needed to become financially stable and able to support themselves. Every achievement starts with its decision to try. To learn more about Catholic Charities Family Self-Sufficiency Program, call 847-782-4233 or visit catholiccharities.net. Folks, you probably know that on March 13th, we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the election of Pope Francis as the Bishop of Rome. Ever since his election, he has asked the people of God to pray for him. And so we are joining in an effort asking Catholics on March 13th to say 10 Hail Marys for him. You can learn more about this and register your name at artchicago.org. I encourage all of you to participate in this support of the Holy Father as he celebrates a decade of service to the people of God. The cemetery ministry is a core ministry of our Catholic faith tied to the corporal works of mercy. It's comforting to know that our Catholic cemeteries are caring for the remains of our loved ones awaiting the resurrection. There are 44 Archdiocese of Chicago Catholic cemeteries willing to help you in your time of loss. Call 708-449-6100 or visit catholiccemeterychicago.org. Catholic Cemeteries, serving the Catholic community since 1837. You're listening to Catholic Chicago. Ahead, the Archdiocese of Chicago brings you programs about the people, events, and issues that touch our lives. Thanks for letting us be part of your morning. Now again, Catholic Chicago. Alive, the radio show and podcast of the Office of Human Dignity and Solidarity at the Archdiocese of Chicago. I'm Dawn Fitzpatrick. And in the first half, we just finished up talking about a Lenten project that everyone can get involved with, with their families, with their churches, um, the, with the Rice Bowl, and of course, understanding a little more about what CRS does. And this half of the show, I have a guest that I'd like to welcome. Welcome Anna Slater, who is... Uh, from We Dignify. She's the executive director at We Dignify, and now she is the manager of the Illinois March for Life. Um, Anna's been working in the pro-life movement for almost a decade, starting full-time with We Dignify right after she graduated from Loyola Chicago in 2014. She's mentored hundreds of students, including alumni who serve full-time in pro-life work, public office, and more. Welcome, Anna. 
Thanks, Don. It's great to be here. It's great to see you. I remember you when you were a student, actually, and uh, kind of interning at We Dignify. At the time, it was called yeah. Students for Life of Illinois. Um, and we were we were building the March for Life Chicago. So March for Life Chicago, yeah. which I used to be the president of, but it's kind of mm -hmm. evolved. And after the Roe versus Wade decision, uh, it's moving to Springfield. So let's talk a little bit about that. Why, why did you decide to move to Springfield? Yeah, absolutely. And I do remember my my intern days um, in Chicago and all those fun meetings that um, my old boss would drag me to, but um, it was great. It, was <laughs> pay, it paid off. So it paid fun. off. You learned so much. <laughs> I did. I did learn a lot and I'm grateful. I'm now stepping into his shoes. Um, but yeah, the move to Springfield, I think it mostly came through prayer. Um, you know, our team and our board of directors and our advisory committee, including the Archdiocese of Chicago, you know, we all came together to really pray about what um, what does the state of Illinois need in terms of the pro-life movement. Um, and as we know, with the Dobbs decision, state laws are more important than ever, right. especially because we have this path forward um, for state legislation. And we saw that happen very quickly with our neighboring states. Missouri comes to mind of being the first state to completely outlaw abortion as soon as Roe was overturned. Um, but then in our state of Illinois, see everything going the opposite direction of our, um, the politicians who are in power, especially Governor Pritzker, really pushing for more expansion of abortion, inviting more um, doctors in to perform abortions, expanding it to medical professionals beyond doctors. So all that is to say that there was really this clear need for legislative advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's always been the, you know, a core part of the March for Life Chicago is advocacy to our neighbors, to our legislati legislators, our lawmakers. So going to Springfield really gives us this opportunity of meeting them in their offices. You know, sure. we, we pick um, the date very intentionally of being in March, of being on a weekday, on a Tuesday, three weeks from today, actually, mm -hmm. um, because we know that's when the that's when the lawmakers are in their offices in Springfield. Um, so we really wanted an opportunity to take the, you know, thousands upon thousands of pro-lifers in Illinois and give them an easy way to meet their lawmakers, meet everybody with a community, mm -hmm. um, and still have that same professional, joyful presence that the March for Life Chicago has always had. Celebrate the gift of life. Right. Celebrate all of um, the beautiful children that the pro-life movement supports and their mothers and families. But also just, okay, we're, we're going to be right outside of the Capitol building when all the lawmakers are in their offices. Now we can go talk to them immediately following the march. Sure. So that was the main, you mm -hmm. know, um, I can't take credit. You know, we had very smart people advising us, but also the Holy Spirit really guided us through that process. Well, first he, and foremost. he should always be our guide, right? Um, exactly. Right. But, he gets all the credit. So and if I, it goes I, badly. I think I'm this is, oh, <laughs> well, whatever, but <laughs> it's, I think it's going to go really well. But I think, um, interestingly enough, this has been a, a push that's come from the National March for Life. I know I went to the National March for Life this year, and a lot of people were saying, well, why are, why are we even having it? Roe versus Wade is overturned. But they've made it very clear, obviously, our fight you know, to, to end abortion has really only just begun. Um, this, sure. The states are kind of drawing a line in the sand, and they're saying either we want to be known for abortion or we would like to be known for being a pro-life state. Um, our state in Illinois wants to be known for abortion, but I don't think that every person who lives here, as a matter of fact, I would venture to say the majority of the people who live in this state would probably like to see the laws um, restricted a little bit, if not going away altogether. So I think that, and what, what March for Life um, in Washington has said is, we need to focus on the state capitals. So I think this is very apropos for us to take what we were doing in Chicago to the state capitol and really try to get some more focus so that the whole state knows this is an issue. Um, I think when we were running March for Life Chicago, we tried to say, this isn't just for Chicagoans. This is actually an interstate worry. We wanted, to, it was a Midwest thing because Chicago is the home of so many of the abortions that happen from all over the Midwest. Um, but, I, but I'm with you. I think if we're gonna make a difference, we need to be at the state capitol where the lawmakers are when they're there. Which is, yeah, um, absolutely. And that's, I think that's something we see consistently um, 
you know, we we know kind of subjectively we can we can feel that Illinois is an outlier on abortion law when it comes to our neighboring states to the Midwest. But also objectively, we can look at the data um, in 2020, the state of Illinois performed more abortions than all of our neighboring states combined. Uh Um, And, you know, I think it's easy for us to say, well, Illinois, you know, by population is much bigger than Missouri, Iowa, Wisconsin, Kentucky. But when you look at the ratio, it's about one in five pregnancies in Illinois end in abortion, which is much higher than the ratio for our neighboring states as well. Um, And even since the Dobbs decision, there was a news article where one of the representatives of Planned Parenthood of Illinois said that their clinic, I believe it was the one um, on the southern Illinois border near Missouri and Kentucky, said they've seen patients from as many as 30 states come to Illinois just in the seven months since the Dobbs decision. Um, yep. So we're really seeing Illinois is, is the epicenter of the problem. So that's our tagline with the Illinois March Live is to save Midwestern lives. But yes. it's really just to save lives, you know, save yes. um, these children. And we, what I think is really heartbreaking for me, you know, I'm a, I'm a young woman, I'm a young mother, I have two little kids. Um, and I really have seen, I think that um, I have been really blessed and really lucky. I have had amazing doctors and midwives who have cared for me and cared for my children. Um, And I've seen what that, how important that is, right? Mm -hmm. To care for a mother through her pregnancy and care for her child with the utmost love, the utmost respect, and really the true care of making sure that I'm healthy, that my child's healthy. And I want that for every mother. And the laws that Illinois is pushing and expanding right now are not supporting mothers truly. No. Um, they're supporting abortion. They're, prov- you know, if, if your goal is just more abortion, no matter what, it's going to accomplish that. Um, we saw that in the lame duck session of expanding abortion care. Um, their words, you know, is abortion access to non-physicians. And um, Dr. Bill Howder, um, who is an Illinois representative, he'll be speaking at the Illinois March for Life rally. He gave a really great speech. You can find it um, on YouTube and on his Facebook page of saying, well, yes, you can train a midwife. You can train a physician's assistant in a suction abortion. You can train them in just the basic procedure. But what you can't do that doctors do in medical school is train them for all of the possible complications that could come from that. They're not prepared for a perforated uterus or any of these complications. And um, I I look at that, you know, as a pro-lifer, as a pro-life advocate, as a mother, as a woman and say, what, who are we supporting right now? What are we really after? Are we after caring for women, which, you know, we claim to have a goal or are we just promoting more abortions no matter what? Um, So that I think is really, and I think you're right, Don, there's, many, many people, even people who identify as pro-choice, we've talked to them. You know, I I work on a college campus. I talk to them every day who, even if they identify as pro-choice or pro-abortion, they do care for women. So when you talk to them about like, well, do you want people who aren't medical experts in this taking care of women? Do you want, you know, are you willing to risk women's health for the sake of abortion? And they say, whoa, 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 no one's saying that. I'm like, well, actually, actually, that's what this the is laws the are law saying. of the state. Right. <laughs> this is, this is what you're advocating for. Well, and they, um, they're talk about how they want abortion to be safe. It's not safe at all the way that Illinois is, is doing it. Um, with and almost anybody can perform an abortion now. We, we, we're sneaking young girls in from where God knows where without their parents' permission or even knowledge. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's available with, with no license requirements. It's available without being inspected. How, how is that safe? Um, it just makes no sense to me. But um, yeah, me either. And that's something I think we can really, I'm hopeful for in going to the legislators. You know, we're working with our partners who, um, you know, like Catholic Conference of Illinois for one, obviously yeah. the different Catholic dioceses across the state and saying, um, we're going to the legislators. And I think there's really some questions of, if you ask the lawmakers themselves, like, can you can you explain this to me? Right. Can you walk through what you're advocating for? Because, and I don't want to call it, they're not, you know, they're not ignorant. They're they're smart, informed individuals, but I really don't think, I think they just take the baseline of what they receive. You know, right. they say, oh, this is what you should be advocating for if you support women. And they say, oh, okay, well, I support women. And if you dig a little deeper into that, 
um, I think you really see past the facade of women's health, you see that this isn't supporting women's health. No. This is supporting profits for, for the abortion, the abortion industry. industry. Yeah. Okay. Well, we need, we need to take a break. So I think we could talk about this a lot longer, but let's take a break right now and we'll be back in just a couple minutes and we'll continue this discussion about the March for Life of Illinois. Thank you. I was dead in the grave I was covered in sin and shame I heard mercy call my name He rolled the sun away Amen, Amen. I'm alive, I'm alive because He lived Amen, Amen For more than 20 years, Catholic Charities Adult Protective Services has been advocating for seniors who are the victims of abuse, neglect, confinement, or financial exploitation. With our partners at local, city, and state agencies, our trained case managers follow through on every concern that is brought to our attention in a cooperative way to ensure that our seniors are safe and protected. According to the Illinois Department on Aging, last year nearly 21,000 cases of elder abuse were reported in Illinois. Of these, only 5% were reported by seniors themselves. So raising awareness is an important part of this issue. If you are concerned about a senior you know, call 800-252-8966. That's 800-252-8966. With your help, we can stop elder abuse and look out for the seniors in our lives. I am a seminarian. The church needs compassionate and well-trained priests to help guide each of us through life. What inspires me, what draws me always to the priesthood is continue to see priests be a beacon of hope for other people. You can play a part in the education of these young men as they prepare for a life of service to others. I want to be that beacon of hope too, and it's, it sets my heart on fire. To support our seminarians, make your gift at archchicago.org slash seminarianfund or call 312-534-7959. Catholic Charities Refugee Resettlement Program has been especially busy this year, assisting individuals and families who have fled dangerous situations in their homeland, including Afghanistan and the Ukraine. The Refugee Resettlement Team helps with everything they need to start to rebuild their lives in a new country, including housing, employment, clothing, food, English classes, and referrals for legal and immigration services. The refugees are tremendously grateful for the compassion and practical help they're receiving, and they're giving back and helping each other plan for a brighter, safer future. Volunteer opportunities are currently available for those who would like to be family mentors and tutors so children and adults can practice English. To learn more about these rewarding opportunities, call 312-655-7096. That's 312-655-7096. Welcome back to Fully Alive. I'm Dawn Fitzpatrick, and I am talking with Anna Kinski, who is the executive director of We Dignify. We Dignify is currently the owner of the Illinois uh, March for Life, which will be in Springfield on March 21st. We were just talking about how um, how bad Illinois has become for abortions, meaning that we are one of the more welcoming areas for abortion, and we have keep putting things into law 
that uh, make it not only easier and easier to get one, but the conditions worse and worse. Um, and and really, there the state is proving how uh, against women they really are, rather than for women. Although everything's upside down, and the rhetoric always seems to purport that things they're doing are the exact opposite of what they're really doing. And this is what I'm finding. Um, because all of these laws that have gone into place in Illinois are only hurting the women um, rather than helping them. As we said, there's, you know, the, there's no licensing requirements. We're now saying that just about any medical professional can perform an abortion. And they, although they may be trained to quickly do the abortion, what about complications? What about medical needs? What happens if there's, um, if, if the woman has an issue and, and really needs a doctor to help her? Uh, there's no doctor there, you know, all kinds of things. Um, and now there's a couple of more bills that we need to fight. And I think this is what we're really going to be focusing on in March, um, both right after the March. And also we're hosting a Life Advocacy Day on Wednesday, the 22nd. So people that might want to stay a second day can get some training from us, meaning the diocese, diocese as my counterparts and uh, Catholic Conference to, to go talk to your legislator. So let's talk about those bills that are that are proposed that are very much in danger of um, further expanding our abortion laws. It is Senate Bill 1909 and House Bill 2463. Now, my understanding is they are essentially the same bill in in both um, both sections of our Congress. So, what? Why don't you yeah, tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, you're correct. They're identical bills, I believe. Um, the wording, although I will admit I've only read one of them front to back, but um, they're identical bills introduced from both legislative houses, really an attempt to. Um, I think get them there quickly, although we don't have a committee hearing yet. So um, the title of it um, is the Deceptive Practices of Limited Services Pregnancy Centers Act. Uh. Um, so yeah, it's while it's a mouthful, but really what it claims to be is to be protecting um, the ability of individuals, meaning women, to make autonomous, informed, and evidence-based decisions about having an abortion. So again, like what you were saying, Don, with a lot of these bills on the face value, you're like, oh, informed, autonomous decisions. You know, that sounds like something that we want to support for anyone Absolutely. making a decision, right? Right. Um, but really what it is, it's very reminiscent for those who've been following along with abortion law. It's very reminiscent of what was then Senate Bill 1564 in 2016 which is forcing pregnancy centers to cooperate with abortion. Um, so really forcing any pro-life pregnancy center, um, there's more than 95 in the state of Illinois who work tirelessly. I mean, these um, these centers really provide everything from diapers and pregnancy tests all the way through cribs, car seats, parenting classes. I mean, the, the value of a pregnancy resource center to the women they help cannot be overstated. Um, but what really this is trying to do is to take these, what they're calling limited services pregnancy centers, what we would call crisis pregnancy center or pregnancy resource center. Center mm -hmm. and say, if you want to help women, you can do that, but only if you also tell them where to go get an abortion, um, which well, is, you know, that's material cooperation. That's not, yes. that's forced speech. Well, um, and there's already a stay on, on what happened, you know, several years ago. So it's already on its way to the Supreme Court. So I don't know why they're pushing this, just yeah. calling it something else. And I know. And I think they, they've changed the wording and the way that they would do it enough, I think, that it could theoretically become law and then get held up in the court system again. And it because will. what happened with SB 1564 is it took, you know, it was either six or seven months um, for it to finally be enjoined by the court and say, okay, pregnancy resource centers can can start serving women again. Um, because I remember I was I was in Chicago at the time. I was a volunteer at yeah. um, Eight for Women, and they were one of the centers that had gotten an injunction from 50, SB 1564. They got it really early, so they were able to- And they to... got it really early. Yeah. And what had, you know, there's a lot of cooperation among the pregnancy centers. The ones who didn't have an injunction said like, you know, we can't, we can't risk being shut down permanently. We also can't refer for abortions because that goes against our consciences, right? We are pro-life. Yes. We don't believe that's good for women or their children. So what they did is they would, they literally forwarded their calls to Aid for Women. And I, it was so busy. You know, I, I wasn't on staff. I was just I a volunteer. Um, it was, it was so 
crazy to see the number of women coming through who needed help in these situations and women who were considering abortion, women who weren't considering abortion, but just needed help to be able to choose life and support their child. You know, I, I really, I really feel that, you know, our pregnancy resource centers are, are the backbone of helping women, you know, they're the backbone of the pro-life movement, but really when, um, when you look at what they provide, and again, like Don, like I'm, you know, as as a mother and as a grandmother, you know, it takes it takes a real village to raise children. Yes. Yes. Um, and I've been incredibly blessed with my family, with our support systems to help us raise our two kids. Um, and it's part of the reason my husband and I are so passionate about supporting pregnancy resource centers with um, our volunteer time and our donations and why um, the Illinois March for Life as well. You know, we've um, we've done diaper drives. We always right. promote the great work of our pregnancy resource center partners. So um, these bills, you know, again, it's that deceptive language of, oh, we're trying to support women. You know, we don't want them to get you know, false information or fake news, but in reality, what it's going to do and what I think at some point their goal is, is to shut down the pregnancy centers well, so that there's, again, more abortions, you know, well, exactly. the goal is not helping women, the goal is more abortions. So if we really are pro-choice, then let's give real choices where the pregnancy center, it, it, they are there to do like what you're saying. You have all of that support in your life. Not all women do. So the pregnancy centers provide that. They are there to walk with the woman. They're there to give her things she needs. They help her get medical care. They're there to love her, to help her be, feel empowered, to be a strong mother, which is what the these abortion clinics are saying. You know what? You can't do this. As a woman, you can't possibly have a life and be a mother. Now, how in the heck is that empowering? It's all it's all about killing your child and then the woman has to live with that the rest of her life. So these pregnancy centers are set up so that women don't have to live with that kind of decision. They have options. They have true options. So absolutely. And, and that's something, you know, and this happened, I mean, this comes up ever so like, you know, pretty often of, okay, let's say there's a woman who does, she wants to carry to term. She wants to parent her child or she wants to make an adoption plan. If she walks into Planned Parenthood or another abortion clinic and says, I don't want an abortion, what do they have to offer her? Right. Because the vast majority don't offer any sort of prenatal care, right? They'll say, oh, go find a doctor, go find this. But even once they find prenatal care, okay, who's going to help them with diapers? Who's going right. to help them with a crib? Or um, who's going to, I mean, I really- Well, that's why they end up saying so abortion. Is, right, abortion is your only option then, right? That's yeah. what they say. So. So I, I I only have a minute left, so I really want to make sure everybody knows they can they can come to Springfield on the twenty first, stay till the twenty second, and you can also get involved in our life advocacy day on the twenty second. There's um there's a mass at ten o'clock um, that will be held um, at the the college auditorium there, the Sagamon Auditorium. And yes. Bishop Paprocki will be leading that mass along with other concelebrants. The March for Life starts at noon uh, with a rally in front of the Capitol building. And then if you're not one that can march, um, there will be adoration at the cathedral from 1215 until 4. So you're certainly welcome to do that because we will need prayers. And then, as I said, you can either go in the afternoon and lobby or you can wait until the next day and we'll give you some training and you can lobby. Now, if you go to... Um, you can see there's information here on the March the March for Life. It would be IllinoisMarchForLife.org website, or you can go to RespectLifeChicago.org and navigate to events, and you'll see what we're suggesting as far as come to the March, come to the Life Advocacy Day. And we even have a room block at the uh, Courtyard Marriott in Springfield for 124 a night. So if you want to come for as many as three nights, which is what I'm going to do, um, you're welcome to join us. So please, let's step up. Again, like I said in the last half, last half hour, you're baptized. What are you doing about it? This is um, an opportunity to stand up for life, to answer God's call, to, to take care of the needy, to take care of the vulnerable, and to help women. My goodness, right? So let's go to Springfield, yeah. March 21st and 22nd. And you'll get to see Anna, you get to see me, um, and hopefully thousands of others like-minded people here in Illinois, right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I will look forward to seeing you there, Dawn. And um, I hope everyone can join us March 21st and 22nd. Absolutely. God bless you, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. 
Um, I hope you get involved in a Lenten project like the Rice Bowl, as well as coming to the March for Life of Illinois in Springfield and Life Advocacy Day. God bless you. Talk to you again in April. Thanks, Anna.